കരുണാർണവമായി കരുതഗതി നൽകും അരുണാചല ശിവം നമസ്തെ വെൽക്കം ടു ദ നെക്സ്റ്റ് എപ്പിസോഡ് ഓഫ് ദൃ ദൃശ്യ വിവേക today we're going to talk about the relativity of perception text 2 nila pita stula sukshma rishva dir dhadi bedata nana vidhani rupani pashyel lochanam ekada the forms objects of perception appear various on account of distinctions such as blue yellow gross subtle short long etc the eye on the other hand sees them all but remains one and the same text 3 andyam amdya patu tveshu netra dharmeshu chaikadha sankalpayen mana shretra tvagadai yojyatam idam the mind is able to cognize characteristics of the eye such as blindness sharpness or dullness because it is a unity this also applies to whatever is perceived through the ear skin etc so the objects of the world that we perceive appear in a bewildering variety but we're able to discern or distinguish or recognize this variety uh, viveka because the eye and the same applies to the other senses remains the same For example as I look around the room here before me I see thousands of changes maybe tens of thousands I don't know For example in the door sunlight is coming but over in the corner it's dark or there's this form over here that looks like a chair and another one closer that looks like a microphone and then there's a shelf full of puja equipment and all kinds of stuff and over here there's a window in the holy mountain <laughs> all these forms are different and because they're different we recognize them as being what they are we perceive them because the eye does not change and the same with the ear nose tongue skin etc of course changeability means that these objects are illusory they are maya they're not real because they change but the relativity of perception is that the eye or other sense remains relatively unchanged For example, when I look at the room and I see thousands of distinctions, the eyes don't change. Maybe they look this way and that way, but that's all. The eyes themselves don't change. Think of it as a measurement. If I take a measurement, let's say with a ruler, huh? I have a ruler that's a certain length. I know what length it is. Somewhere there is a standard ruler. <laughs> one foot or whatever and then i apply that to different objects and i take their measurements and one is 3/4 of an inch another one is 6 inches another one is even bigger than my ruler and i have to get another one so the point is the ruler doesn't change but the objects that it measures are different So perception is possible only when the perceiver is relatively unchangeable with respect to the perceived where the subject remains constant while the object changes. And then the next shloka 3 talks about the mind. 
and how the mind views the eye and sees the changes in the eye. Like sometimes when we first get up in the morning, huh? It's like, uh, eyes are kind of blurry. <laughs> or if we need glasses, we say, oh, my vision is blurry or weak. And then at other times, it looks very clear and sharp. Or if the eye becomes injured, the mind says, oh, now I'm blind. I can't see anything. Or if you're simply blindfolded, <laughs> can't see. So how does the mind know this? How is the mind able to discern this or distinguish it? Viveka, again. It's because the mind remains relatively unchanged and it remembers the past states of the eye and it compares the memory with the way the eye is now. So this is the relativity of perception and without it, perception would be meaningless. The meaning, as always, comes from the context. And that which is relatively unchanged provides the context for that which changes. You might say, well, this is obvious, right? <laughs> but like many obvious things, many fundamental things, it's so obvious that we never give it any thought. We simply accept it as a, an assumption and we go on with our lives without really thinking about it. But if we look into it, if we inquire, huh, then we see that this relativity is an essential part of our consciousness, without which we would be unable to recognize objects, we would be unable to function in the world, because we would be unable to compare the previous state of an object with its current state and determine how it has changed. So because we can do this, that gives us so many abilities and so many ways to interact with our environment, so many ways to perceive things based on their differences. The wall is blue. The chair is dark red. The microphone is silver. The phone is white. Uh, everything has its own color. The chair, the cloth covering the chair is red. And so on. The, my Bosma is white. <laughs> everything has its own color, shape, form, and other attributes that we can infer just by looking at it. For example, like density. If we see a rock, we know it's heavy and it, it can't be easily penetrated. If we see water, we know that, yeah, it's heavy, but at least I can penetrate it. I can stick my hand in it or I can pour it into a different container and it takes the shape of that container and so on. If it's air, well, it has very little density and I can move through it effortlessly. And if it's ether or space, it has no resistance at all. So this is how we judge things. This is how we know things. This is how we perceive and cognize things based on their differences. But this assumes that the perceiver remains relatively constant. This is a very important point leading up to the next shloka, which is a crucial <laughs> crucially important shloka and we're going to save that for the next time but today I just want to go over a few details related to the relativity of perception. One of the important aspects of perception is that it's illusory. <laughs> everything that changes, everything that appears to be different, everything that appears to be an individual object is actually an illusion, a mirage. Just like if you go in the desert, you may see off in the distance what looks like water. But if you go there, you'll find there's no water at all. In the same way, there's the classic example of the rope and the snake. There's a rope coiled in the corner. Huh? And if we go out at night and see it, 
we might think, oh, it's a snake. But the identification of the rope as a snake is only in our imagination. It's only because we have a memory of a snake, an experience in the past that makes us afraid of snakes and so many impressions about snakes that when we see a similar shape, we tend to jump to the conclusion, oh, it's a snake. But this is a vasana. This is an upadi, you see? This is a covering of the actual reality. And when we look at the rope in the daylight, we see, oh, it's a rope. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> and in the same way, when we look at everything from the point of view of Brahman, then we see that it's all an illusion. It's all just a projection of our minds. Name and form, the Buddha says. Name and form creates consciousness, and consciousness creates name and form. Consciousness projects, and name and form are the illusions that this is a separate object, this has its own identity, huh? it's different than other things, it can move, it can change, I can paint it a different color. So many of these ideas that we have, which are completely illusory. Actually, Brahman is one, and Brahman is everything. But we perceive differences because our consciousness is covered by illusion. These upadis, these vasanas, uh, these sankharas, projecting a certain expectation or reality on our surroundings. And because of this mental activity, this illusion, we also perceive ourselves in an illusory way. We think, I am an individual. And this mind and body is myself. And I have so many desires. I have so many needs and expectations. I have so many possessions. I have so many activities. Huh? I have to do this and I have to do that. <laughs> and then along comes coronavirus. <laughs> you see, our tiny mental activities are no match for the actual power of nature, the actual power of God. I was watching a wonderful video by Narsingha Rao the other day. He's an astrologer, Vedic astrologer from India, very excellent astrologer. And he was saying this coronavirus is an, a, the play of the mother, is the way he put it. It's the play of the mother to restore balance to the planet and to the human race because we're so far out of balance. This global culture of uh, consumerism and capitalism has gotten to such an extreme that now nature itself is taking action to correct it. And global warming is happening, pollution, cancer, heart disease, all these things are karmic results to our previous activities of exploiting the world, the matter, the nature. So all of this is actually illusory. <laughs> we can say, I have my karma, I have my activities and possessions, and so on, and so on, and so on. We can say like that. But what happens at the time of death? The body falls off, the gross body falls off, the anamaya kosha falls away, why? Because the karma connected with that body is exhausted. It's finished. When that karma is used up, the prarabdha karma, or the ripened karma of this life, then the body falls off. But the subtle body, the pranamaya kosha, uh, the energy body, the mental body, the manomaya kosha, the vijnanamaya kosha, the intelligence, and the ananda maya kosha, they go off and they can create a new body if necessary, if there's additional karma to be uh, experienced, or if one can attain liberation in this life, then they also dissolve and all that's left is the ananda maya kosha, which is pure awareness, pure consciousness, 
awareness of awareness, which is the symptom of Brahman. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shakti Aung.